book of Revelation chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read verses 9 to 20. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. Revelation 1, 9 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what it says. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And I, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of our God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we pray today. Thank you that you are good and you are indeed with us. Um, and we ask that you would uh, even now be opening our eyes and hearts and minds that we, would, um, that we would be able to know and see you. Jesus, we pray that you would be helping us uh, know you and that these words would be coming alive, that the, the truth that they're expressing would come alive to us right now, that we would see you as you are with, you, with your church, walking with your church. Um, and uh, Jesus, transform us by, by this vision that we would know, that we would know your presence with us. So Jesus, send us your spirit, and we ask that you would um, do that work in us. Give us that surety. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're uh, in our group here, brothers and sisters, we're all in different stages of life, in different circumstances. Some of it is obvious uh, by age. Um, we're a younger group here, so some of you maybe are still, we have some people who are still in high school or college. Um, some are beginning their first jobs. Others have been out for a while. Some are forming families already. Um, and uh, there's some, I don't know if we have, do we have any? We may have a few who are empty nesters here, right? Who've already had their kids grow up and out. Uh, so we have a few here that are that. But we're in different stages of our life. In your work and career, we're in different stages. Some of you are just in the preparation for it. Others of you are exactly where you want to be. You're, you, you're doing what you want to do, and uh, you're content in it. Others of you are uh, in maybe a stepping stone stage, right? You're beginning to get there. You've just begun your work, and you're getting out. Others of you maybe are just not content at all. Your situation is difficult, your boss is hard, and you would love to be doing something else. Uh, we could go on and on, but in our life circumstances, family relationships, different dynamics, different situations. Um, we, uh, uh, your family, some of you have great families, supportive families. Others of you are going through some difficult times, trials, um, uh, lack of unity in family. And, and then our friends and those around us. Some of you are, have very supportive people. Others of you have gone through trials where maybe even being a Christian is, is hard around family and friends, or in your workplace. Um, and we are in, we find ourselves in distinct circumstances. We also find ourselves uh, in distinct places spiritually, or distinct places in our walk with the Lord. Some of you are on fire for the Lord right now. You love Jesus. You love walking with him. You spend the time with him. You're excited to share him with others. You're committed to walking in holiness and pursuing him and knowing him more day by day. Others of you maybe had that at one point. 
you had that fire that was burning for the Lord and you loved him and you loved serving and you loved walking with him and you, you wanted to give your all for Jesus. And this kind of got cold. And now it's easier to just maybe turn on Netflix and give space to some of the sins that before maybe you fought harder against. Um, others, maybe somebody here just say, oh, well, I, I never really begun that relationship with the Lord. I never actually really ever had that fire. Some of you may be really fighting well, fighting against sin. Others are giving or compromising deeply in some areas of your life. And so we're a church, we are a, dis, uh, a diverse group of people, not just in our faces, right? a CCP's motto, one church, many faces, but also what, we are in distinct stages of our life, distinct circumstances God has placed us in. And as a church, we have people in different stages of your walk with the Lord right now. You're in different spots. But there's something in common that we all have. And that is that Jesus is with his church. The same Jesus is with his church. The same Jesus is with each and every one of us, no matter where we are. And the book of Revelation, this vision that we saw, is Jesus walking with his church. He is in, he's telling his church, I am with you. I am walking with you where you are. And we'll see, there's distinct circumstances these churches are in, but Jesus is with each and every one of them. Jesus is with each and every one one of them. So I want us to look at that today, uh, look at what this, this vision that John saw in the book of Revelation and what that means for us individually and collectively as a church, that Jesus is with his church. Jesus is with his church. So if, if you look at this vision that John had, beginning in verse 9, uh, John begins, he's writing this letter to the church, and he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Um, it, it's an interesting beginning of the book as John writes to fellow brothers and sisters. And he has three things that at times we don't always associate together, right? The kingdom and tribulation and patient endurance. So what we, what we see is that the kingdom and tribulation is not necessarily opposite concepts. Sometimes I, I think we, we, we view that if we were only to... Um, follow Jesus close enough, God would take all our problems away. But you know of the 12 apostles. John is one of the 12. This is the apostle John who's writing. The apostle John in this circumstance, where is he? He's in Patmos. He's exiled. He's on an island, exiled because of the testimony of the word of the Lord. I mean, think kind of, if you want to think of a historical example, think of France, right, and the exile Napoleon, right? They put him on a little island, right? He's supposed to be exiled. That's when he comes back, but uh, they, John didn't have that same army behind him. Uh, but so think of it. You exile somebody. You have a, he's a prisoner, so you, you get him out, and you put him on this little island. He's a prisoner there. The idea is John is there because he's preaching the word of God, and the Roman authorities say basically, okay, get out. We're going to exile you to this little island. You're going to be locked up there, and then you can stop this uh, preaching of Jesus that you're doing. Now, John is actually the only one of the 12 apostles who doesn't die for his faith. The, the history tells us 11 of the 12 apostles were martyred for their faith. So John is writing out of exile. He's writing out of tribulation, right? And he says, I'm a partner with you in tribulation, right? But not just tribulation, the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God is advancing. And if you are a Christian, you are part of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom advances even despite tribulation. Uh, the Bible is, another week we'll look more deeply at this, but the Bible is very clear, very clear that we should not be surprised when we face trials and temptations and tribulations. The promise is not, if you come to know Jesus, that he will magically take away all difficulties from your life. And why is this? We are in a spiritual war. The kingdom of heaven is advancing and we are in a spiritual war and there will be resistance. There will be resistance. So that's where the tribulation comes in. We are in this spiritual war and John experienced it in Patmos. So brothers and sisters, don't be surprised with your friends, with your family, in your work. When you face opposition, when you face people making fun of you, when you face uh, maybe people uh, making life difficult for you in your work because they don't like that you're a Christian, that shouldn't be a surprising thing. 
It shouldn't be a surprising thing because we are in a spiritual war. But we also have the kingdom. We are part of a victorious kingdom that is advancing. And we are called, one of the grand themes in the book of Revelation is that we are called to endure in the midst of all trials. We are called to endure. So John writes out of this spot to the church saying, we're part of the kingdom, we're in the spiritual war, and we are called to endure. And, and, and the book begins then with a vision of Jesus. Because when we ask, how do you support tribulation? How do you support trial? How do you support worshiping God in a culture that may not love Jesus? How do we do it? We fix our eyes on Jesus. So the very first thing that God does is he gives John this revelation of who Jesus is. And John has this, uh, this vision of a glorified Christ, a king reigning over his church. So look, look at this image again with me. So I don't, I don't know how many of you, like we read these things in the Bible sometimes, and we don't really, like I think we read it, but we don't really read it, right? So if you look at verses 12 through 16, and if you read it like this as we're reading it, and you read kind of like, it's kind of like we read it like this. Um, or verse 10. Let me, let me look, read this one. We read it like this. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard, ooh, I heard a voice like a trumpet saying, a voice like a trumpet, right? <laughs> Did you catch what it said? <laughs> like, we, we read it like this is, like we're reading a, an instruction manual of how to, you know, <laughs> you build Ikea furniture, which you're not supposed to be able to mess up, but I have, right? <laughs> We read it like we're reading an instruction manual. This is, that means we're not, we're not engaged with what we're reading. So, so I just want to pause real quick here and, and see this image. Let the image touch you. A voice like a trumpet. Right? I mean, can you imagine someone whose voice is like a trumpet? Can you imagine if I spoke and you said, how's the pastor preach? Well, I mean, his voice is like a trumpet, right? Just, right? And then later, and he'll say, it's like the sound in verse 16. It's like his voice was like the roar of many waters. You, you like, maybe you can think um, Niagara Falls. When I've been there, you see the, the, the falls and the, the water pouring down. If you stand behind them, it's really hard to hear somebody when you talk to them. And so it's like the roar of many waters is the voice of Jesus as he appears. Um, and, and he goes on with this image that he has a golden sash. He has this long robe. Um, and, and here, his hair is white. White like wool. White like snow. This bright, the idea, this image of clean and pure and just white, white. This is an image of purity. Um, and his feet are like burnished bronze. And, oh, and I skipped his eyes. You look at his eyes. And they're flames of fire. Can you imagine seeing an image of someone and his eyes are like, the best way you can describe him, it's like they're on fire. Flames of fire. His face, it says, uh, is, uh, is shining like the sun. His face shines like the sun. So now what's this image do when you stop and think of the image? What is the response to seeing Jesus exalted like this? It's an image of, the Spanish group talks back to me. <laughs> Come on, you're too Americanized. Let's go. <laughs> uh, it's an image of worship. Right, of awe, of wonder. Right? If you see this image of the resurrected Christ, you're not gonna yawn. You're not gonna you're not gonna say, oh, oh, oh eyes like like flames of fire. Oh man. Right? Wow. The eyes are like flames of fire. His face is, is shining like the sun. So it's an image of a of an exalted, glorified, powerful Christ. Our God who died has rose and he lives. He is reigning. Um, and Jesus himself says that, Fear not, I am the first and last, the living one. I died, and behold, I live forevermore. So John has seen Jesus die. He has seen him rise from the dead. He has seen him ascend into heaven. And now here in heaven, John sees Christ exalted and in power, reigning in power. Even in the midst of his tribulation, where is Jesus? Jesus is reigning in power. Amen? He reigns in power. Uh, but he doesn't just... Our God, uh, let me just pause here. Uh, catch that image. 
And I want to encourage you, as you read the Bible's images, meditate on them. It's an image. Christ rules. He has full authority. He has power. Nothing is beyond him. But this resurrected, reigning, powerful king, he's, just, he's not just kind of in heaven now with the clock turned on, set up, wound up, kind of minding his own business, ignoring us, right? Where, what is Jesus doing? Where is he in this image? He's walking among seven candlesticks. Right? And, and, and the Bible itself tells us what this lamp stands. Uh, he's walking among these lamp stands. And the Bible tells us those symbolize the seven churches. The seven churches, the book of Revelation is written to these seven churches uh, that are in what would be modern day Turkey. And it's written to these seven churches. And Christ is walking in the midst of them. Jesus is walking in the midst of them. It means that our resurrected Christ is still present with his church. So, so last week we're celebrating Pentecost, right? And last week was Pentecost and Jesus has ascended. He's poured out his Holy Spirit on us and he's still with us. Remember the promise in Matthew when Jesus, um, at the very last verse of Matthew, it's the Great Commission. Everyone knows, go and make disciples of all nations. You know how it ends? And surely I am with you till the end of the age. It doesn't say surely I'm with you till Y2K that came and going or whatever else that they, um, I, yeah, <laughs> I went to a store once after that happened in a Christian store and I asked them, where do all your Y2K books go, right? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, the world was going to end with Y2K, but it didn't. Um, so, so, uh, oh, that's right. We have a young group here. I forget. Some of y'all looking at me like, what's Y2K? Okay, well, I'll explain to you later. <laughs> they weren't even, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I missed cultural reference. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it next time. <laughs> but the point is, Jesus doesn't end. A, a millennium comes and goes. Jesus doesn't, doesn't disappear from his church. It wasn't a historical thing that we go to a museum and see the work of God when Jesus was with his church, or in the Reformation, it was, there was an outpouring of a return to the word of God, and God's spirit was with his church, and now he's not. Jesus has not left his church. Jesus is always with his church. Pentecost is not this thing that was just this one-time event that gave special power to the early church, and the church advanced, and then that's it. And we got to go read it in a, in a book, um, and talk about it as if it's a past event. Jesus remains with his church when? Till the end of the age. Jesus is always with his church. And if you look then at the book of Revelation, it, it, this image, Jesus is walking among these lampstands, walking among these stand, lampstands that symbolize these seven churches. If you go and look at the seven churches, you will see they are in distinct circumstances, various circumstances. One of the churches, Jesus promises, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on this place. Um, I love it. Everyone likes to um, dom read that one and say, this is a promise for the church. He's going to keep you from the hour of trial. But they forget that another church, Jesus says to them, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Right? So these, these, aren't, these uh, letters to the church are examples of different circumstances people can find themselves in. I mean, think of today. Think of the church today. Where is the church today? scattered throughout the world. Is the church in the same circumstance in every country? No. There's brothers and sisters who are dying for their faith. There are countries where you can't profess Christ. There are countries where you can't evangelize, where you can't tell others of Christ. There are brothers and sisters who ha have bombs placed in their churches. There are other Christians, and the U.S. is probably in this, where we have freedom. Maybe there's some cultural opposition. But there, the temptation is what? Maybe to compromise the value. A lot of lukewarm Christians. Laodicea, the church is uh, told that they have lost, they, they have become lukewarm. That is, they're not hot and not cold, so they're not really good for anything. And other churches are, are um, maybe just making compromises with the world, trying to be too hip, trying to be too popular, that they, they've given up the gospel. Right? So all these different circumstances, these churches, if you look through the book of Revelation, if you read through it and read the seven churches, they are in distinct, different situations they find themselves. But what is the same with all of them? Jesus is with his church. Jesus is walking with them. And if you, um, if you look 
at the letters, there's something really important. When we have trials and tribulations, when we have uh, situations, when we talk to God about our life, where do we often begin? We begin with my problem, my circumstance, my trial, my difficulty. We tend to begin there. Where does Jesus begin? With the churches. If, if you look, just look at one example, chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. God begins where? In the, with Jesus. With who Jesus is. And, and in the book of Revelation, in these seven letters, each and every one of these references to who Jesus is, is a reference back to the vision John saw in chapter 1. And so what God begins, and he says to the church, what he reminds them of, of is who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. So the first thing we do, brothers and sisters, is what? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Do you have trials? Are you tired? Are you facing opposition? Are you not happy with something in your life? <laughs> what do you do first? Start by fixing your eyes on Jesus. If you start by fixing your eyes on Jesus, then you go to your trial. The trial doesn't seem as big. Think of it this way. What's, what's more powerful? Your sin or the blood of Christ? What is stronger? Your shame over what you've done or the grace of God? The grace of God. What is more important? The approval of man or the approval of God? The approval of God. Who is more powerful? Your circumstance or God? God. So we start and we begin with who God is. And we remember, God, this is who you are. And then we go. And we speak to him of our life. Beautifully in, this, in these letters too, the very first thing after saying who Jesus is, when Jesus begins talking to his church, what does he tell them? What's the first word? I know. I know. And what Jesus will say is, I know, good and bad. Jesus knows the circumstances. Jesus knows not just the circumstance, because he'll, he'll speak through, I know the trials you're going through. I know how you, how you hate the bad teaching, just as I do. I know you, and, and he knows the circumstance, good and bad, that's going through. But Jesus also knows the heart. He knows the heart. And here's the key, brothers and sisters. God knows not just your circumstance, he knows your heart. He knows where you are. He knows if you're lukewarm. <laughs> right? And it, that's the image in, in to Laodicea. Not hot, not cold, so it's really not good for anything. He knows if that's where you are. He knows if, if you had a fire and it's dying. And it's almost dead. He knows. He knows if you've been making compromises with the world. He knows if you've been living for other things rather than him. God knows. He knows good. And he knows if you've been giving your life to him, the, the service you do in secret, the prayer you do in secret, God knows that too. God knows. So as we come to God, we can say, Father, here I am. God knows exactly where you are, just as you are. Every last bit. And what he, call, what he do, is doing then is he is calling each and every one of us to return to him. <laughs> to return to him or, or for the first time. Maybe you've never come and, and said, Jesus is my first love. Jesus, I'm going to live my life for him. He's my savior. And then Jesus is saying, come now. If, if you were there and it's died, Jesus is saying, come back. Have that first love again. I know you were once alive, and now I want you to have that life again. I want you to walk with me. God knows. God knows. Um, God knows if you've been per pushing on, persevering, faithfully serving him, and you feel, Father, what's the point? I do all this good for you. I serve you, and I, it's getting me nowhere. God knows, and he's saying, son, daughter, continue, press on. I know. God knows. God knows. And he is calling us to follow him with all our heart, to give all our heart to him. Brothers and sisters, where have you maybe made the compromise? Where have you grown, grown cold? Where do you need God to say, come alive again? Where do you need to say, I need to follow my first love again? Are we following our first love? Do we have that longing, that passion that says, I want to be with God. I want to spend time with God. I want to serve God. I want to know him. I want to know his heart. I want to be holy because he is holy. I want to serve him. I want the world to know him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is calling us to that passion, to that love, to say, he is my love. 
I'm, I want to follow him. We, this view that says my eyes are fixed on this exalted image of Christ, this reigning, resurrected Christ, my eyes are fixed there. I see him, his face radiant, his eyes like flames of fire. My eyes are fixed on that. And I am transformed by fixing my eyes on that image. Brothers and sisters, I invite you, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on him. Fall in love with Jesus. Allow him to, to, to make you fall in love with him more than ever before again today. Allow him to transform you. Allow him to take out everything else in your life that is taking his place from you. Or his place that's his. If you look at the letters, they also end on a very positive promise. They end, each and every one, end with a promise to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers. And remember Romans, what's Romans say? We are more than conquerors through him who loves us, right? And what shall, what shall separate us from the love of God? Not life, not death, not powers, not principalities. Nothing in heaven or on earth can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. To the one who overcomes. Overcoming, brothers and sisters, does not mean that you will get your yacht and you will never have a problem and no coworker will ever make fun of you for being a Christian or a, and every single person you ever share the gospel with will be immediately saved. The one who overcomes is this, the one who stays faithful to the Lord no matter what. If there's opposition, I'm faithful to the Lord. If I have to sow and sow and sow and it takes me a decade to see, to see the harvest, I will keep sowing. If I have to continue fighting against my sin, I will keep fighting for, for holiness. I will keep fighting to be transformed into the image of God. I am not giving up. I will overcome. That's the one who overcomes, the one who remains faithful to the Lord no matter the circumstance. And so we began saying, oh, and the promise is that if you look, it's beautiful. We won't look at them all, but God gives a special promise to each church, right? One, they get their own name that God knows. He gives the one who overcomes, God gives them a special personal name, right? God gives them the right to eat from the tree of life. We were exiled in Eden. We're kicked out of Eden. We're exiled and we can't, the cherubim is put there. It's blocking the way to the tree of life. And God says, now you can eat from the tree of life. You can be in the, my very presence and you can eat from the tree of life. There's a promise. If you overcome, there's a blessing. There is a promise. Our labor is not in vain. We, we're not pressing on with a blind faith. We press on in faith, but when, faith isn't blind in this. We know where we're going. We know who we're going to. We have every reason to have faith. It's not, it's not a blind faith. It's not like I built a chair, and you guys might have a good reason to doubt if you should sit in that chair. Who built it? Pastor Chris built it. You sit first, right? I'm not sure if this will stand up. No, following God is not a blind faith like that. Trusting in something that is or is not, who knows? It's a faith in a God who cannot fail. And we will blindly follow wherever he goes, but it is a faith that's rested on him. And we know that we will overcome. And God is promising us that if we will overcome the one who conquers, God has great blessings for you. Yes, in this life and the life to come, but we know ultimately God will Give us himself and one day his full presence. So brothers and sisters, I want to invite us today. As, as we began, we said, we're in different circumstances. And I know a lot of your stories and, and where some of you are, we're in different spots. Wherever you are right now, God is saying, I am with you. I am with you. Whatever pains you have in your life, God is with you. If you're in the, mo the joyful moment of life right now, God is with you. If, and, and more specifically, to the heart of it, where you are with the Lord, God is with you. God is with you if you're on fire for him. God is with you if you're lukewarm. God is with you if you're cold and you feel your faith is about to die. God is with you in your midst. And God is calling each and every one of us to remember, he is with us. And he's calling us to walk with him, to overcome, to press on, to have that patient endurance and continue the race, press on with Jesus and to follow him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is with us. Are you walking with him? Are you allowing your first love to be stirred? Are you allowing uh, God's presence to transform you? Are you saying, I am going to overcome. I'm going to walk with the Lord. I, I invite each one of us to, as, as we go to pray, I invite each and every one of us, pray and ask God, Father, where am I cold? Am I cold? Give me the strength to press on. Make me 
give me back that first love. Or the first time, give me that first love. Examine me. Help me. Is there compromises I'm making? Transform me, Jesus. I want to be, and, and I want to invite each and every one of you to, the, the way to do this is not just a to-do list. It's not just, I, I, I will have failed you if you go home and say, Pastor gave me a to-do list. I'm going to make this to-do list. If you're struggling, if you are struggling to be transformed into God's image, if you are struggling to have that first love, the, remember, what is, how does the message begin? With who Jesus is. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. See him as the exalted reigning king who gave himself for us, who came to life and reigns. Fix your eyes on him and allow that, that, that gaze that's fixed on our resurrected king to transform you and make you after his image and to make you fall in love with him. Let's pray. Father, I pray for us today. Jesus, I, I thank you that you, um, you died and you came to life and you reign forevermore. I thank you for this vision that John saw um, and that even the words that are uh, hard to even just begin to express the glories of who you are. Jesus, you are high and exalted and glorious. I ask that you would help each one of us fix our eyes on you, fix our gaze on you. Let us see you high and exalted as the king who reigns. Let us see you in your holiness, in your glory. Uh, transform us with that. Jesus, let us not grow accustomed to just casually coming to you, but let us deeply know you and worship you and praise you. Father, I, um, I do pray that you would transform each one of us here, that we would all be able to be overcomers, that we would be conquerors through you. And Jesus, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters too. I pray for those who are um, cold right now. I pray that that coldness would be taken away and that the, the image of you, the glory of you would, would be putting uh, flame, um, wood on the fire again, that the flames would be coming up again, that there would be a new, fresh passion. Uh, I pray that you would, that first love we had, that many of us as we begun following you, that first love would be returned, that we would long to know you, that we would long to be with you, that we would long to be transformed after your image. So Father, I pray that you would be doing that in our lives, pouring out your spirit, filling us with your presence. Make us like you, Jesus. And Jesus, I pray for each and every one of us here that you would help us fix our eyes on you, fix our gaze on who you are. Um, and Jesus, I, I thank you because I know that you are with us, you are for us. And that no matter, that in these diverse circumstances and trials and even states of our walk with you, that you are with each and every one of my brothers and sisters. And so we ask in your personal way that you would be making each and every one fall in love with you again, to, to burn with passion, to serve you and know you and be made like you. And we just thank you, Jesus, that as we ask that, we know you, all, you are already 